And with that, we'll just jump right into uh, David Aronchik, who is head of open source uh, machine learning strategy at uh, Microsoft. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, uh, thank you so much for the introduction and the opportunity to come here and speak. Um, uh, that's right, I am uh, head of open source machine learning uh, strategy at uh, Azure. Uh, previously, I worked at Google where I started the Kubeflow project uh, and uh, was one of the first PMs on Kubernetes. And, and so I've seen you know, uh, GitOps as one of the critical functions that, that span across everything. It's how do you take your desired state for everything that you're building and push it through the system? And, and whether or not it's you're rolling out containers uh, or building machine learning platforms or building machine learning solutions, um, you know, I think GitOps is, is critical to that overall function. Um, you know, a little, like I said, a little bit of background. Uh, Microsoft has been doing machine learning for a long time. Um, you know, we use micro, uh, machine learning internally an enormous amount, uh, and we do give back quite a lot. You can see here some of the big benchmarks that we have released in the past few years, uh, open sourced all the, the material, um, and not just use it internally, but, but uh, had other people build on top as well. Um, you know, machine learning does touch just about every function at Microsoft. Commercial, uh, commerce, um, uh, gaming, you know, platform, search engines, and so on. We use machine learning everywhere. Um, and you can see some of the enormous numbers that we use, that, that, that run through our machine learning solutions. Uh, yeah, 180 million active users a month use open uh, office, you know, machine learning backed uh, solutions. 18 billion uh, questions asked of Cortana, uh, 6.5 trillion security events evaluated every day, um, uh, you know, via, you know, Windows and, and other things. Um, and, and the reality is that there's no way we could do any of this without machine learning and a very efficient machine learning platform that allowed us to retrain and understand what was going on at any given time. Um, now, in the machine learning industry, we say a lot of these really big words, and, and they're great, but they're also very hard for folks because this is generally what people you know, run into. Machine learning is pretty hard. Uh, and a lot of the reason that it's hard is because while it, we talk about machine learning as just this, we're going to go out and build some fantastic new model that solves everything that you're looking for, the reality is Building a model is just one small step of an overall process. And that overall process involves many different steps that you have to orchestrate together. Now, let's say you're just a data scientist and you're using your laptop and, and you're able to get to a great model. You're like, ah, I don't care about this. But the reality is you do. And, and the problem is best exemplified by this tweet. You as a data scientist go and create a phenomenal world-changing you know, best in class model, um, but, but actually using that in production is often very detached. You were siloed off, you, you were outside the, the core path for rolling tooling out. The reality is that what we wanna do is we wanna bring those data scientists into an overall platform of development and make it much easier for them to onboard. So, you know, the reason is, is oftentimes that you have these two different camps that are very, very far apart. You have the data scientists who want to move quickly, use the latest tools, uh, do whatever she feels is correct for her particular solution. And then you have the SRE on the other side, who's um, you know, generally much more concerned about stability, enterprise requirements, cor corporate compliance, um, observability, being able to debug in production. And these are often very separated. And so uh, our goal here is to bring them together. Now, you may have heard this before. Obviously, we're at a GitOps conference. I'm going to make a, a reference to that. Uh, you know, developers faced this challenge uh, some years ago before GitOps really, you know, took fire. Uh, you had Git, certainly, as a, a source control mechanism. You had Dev, um, where the, the actual product solution was being developed. And then you had the Ops. Uh, and GitOps was designed to bring all those together and, and basically merge these two circles. On one side, you had that continuous integration development that uh, where the developers were quickly iterating on their solutions, but they were doing it in such a way that bringing that into the overall production ready solution was you know, very uh, elegant and, and you know, was part of the process. It gave you both velocity and security. 
And so for us in the machine learning world, uh, how do we bring this together? Well, we uh, you know, extend GitOps and add it to become MLOps. And, and the idea is basically the same. You have someone on the side who is uh, doing her great work, but then she is brought into those overall circles in the same way that a, a, uh, a domain-specific developer was bringing them in. Um, for example, you know, they were bringing them in for um, uh, you know, your, your app developer, maybe your mobile developer, your IoT developer. They would be operating over here in the same domain-specific area, but then they'd be brought into the center area for uh, doing overall development and rolling out. And so you know, with MLOps, you get a number of benefits, observability and, and auditability and, and you know, uh, validation of all the things that you're rolling out ultimately deriving and giving you velocity and security for ML. Um, now, if you're you know, at a large internal company today, you're probably already doing something like this that you would you know, very quickly look at as being MLOps specific. Uh, you know, at Google, they have TensorFlow Extended, Facebook has FB Learner Flow, uh, Uber has Michelangelo, Microsoft, we use a product called Ether. Um, you know, there are lots of these out there already. Uh, but they're almost all very specific to your organization. And, that, and, that, and that's very hard. That requires a very large amount of team at each of these organizations to keep it up, maintain it, and extend it over time. The question is, is can we build something that is more generalizable, that, that anyone can use? And the answer is yes. Um, the, the way to do this would be to merge together the best of breed components that make sense for you and, and put them together. So you might start with a computation platform or an orchestration platform like Kubeflow, Azure Machine Learning, others. You layer in your own source control, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, excuse me, Bitbucket and so on. Uh, and then you layer on CI, CD on top of that, Jenkins, Azure DevOps, Webflux and so on. Um, each of these together you know, uh, are combined to ultimately provide all the functions that we've talked about already. So let's dive into a little bit more about this. Um, uh, you know, it, it'd be uh, uh, bad of me not to mention that I do work at a cloud provider and we provide a, a hosted solution for many of these. Um, in, in the real world, you'll see multi-cloud solutions like this very often where you might have data processing on-prem uh, and just, you know, you might have training or serving, um, uh, you know, that, that exists in the cloud. It's ultimately this CI/CD pipeline in the middle that pulls everything together, um, and so you want to choose a CI/CD solution that uh, you know knows how to integrate solutions, whether or not they are on cloud, on prem, or some combination of both. In addition to that, uh, you know, let me touch on this distributed cloud element over here. Uh, at Azure, we obviously offer a few different options here. Um, we have automated deployment tools, uh, model versioning and storage. Uh, model validation and model profiling, all of which come together to give you a very clean way to deploy your models um, and is ultimately, you know, something that you can pick and choose. It's just a single API call to execute any one of these functions. Yet at the same time, uh, you know, we handle a bunch of problems that, that really aren't differentiated for your business. Something like figuring out how to scale out, you know, to 500 machines for an afternoon of training and then shutting them all down. That's something that, sure, you could handle internally, but why bother? Uh, it, it's much easier to use a single endpoint to do that. So, so bringing all this together does seem like a lot of work. It's true, but you know what really seems like a lot of work is stuff like this, right? Where you go off and you build this great MLOps solution, or excuse me, this, this model, and it ultimately doesn't get to production. What our goal is with MLOps is to give you end-to-end -end ownership by those data science teams and continuously deliver that value so that you're always making progress against your business. Now, let me explain a little, in a little bit more detail. You know, I've said MLOps is great for a bunch of reasons. Here are three really well, you know, articulated reasons that I think, you know, is, are unique to ML, um, but are something that, that a lot of folks may not pay attention to. So, the first is, is does my model actually work? Um, and, and believe it or not, this, is, this happens a lot more than you would think. Um, you'll have something where you'll have the data scientist on the left and she says, you know, she's gonna go test out her model. Uh, she looks at TensorBoard, it looks great, you know, can't wait to move forward. She pushes it to source control and then pushes that to the cloud. And that seems pretty straightforward, except, you know, all of a sudden everything starts burning down. 
And, and the reason is really subtle. Um, you know, I, I put out a call on Twitter for uh, issues that people have actually had when it came to rolling out models. And in, you know, an hour or so, um, I got this many responses. Um, or it just doesn't work for some unknown reason. Um, you know, ML is really, really subtle and it can fail in a lot of really pernicious ways. Uh, and that's why it's so important to have a clean process for how you roll these things out. So now let's do it again, but let's fold ML ops into the middle. Uh, she still pushes to source control, but at source control point, she pushes through, it automatically pushes through a number of different steps, which are critical for detecting and understanding if things are gonna work properly. Um, now it rolls out and things work fine. And that's obviously what you're supposed to do. Now you can do this all manually, but I would strongly recommend against it because even if you train every data scientist and you had all the tools and you had them all working together and the SREs understood ML and you know what area under the curve meant and all those kind of things, you still need a permanent record of what you rolled out. Um, and that's really what ML Ops is great at. It gives you that defined set of content that you always can go back and look at and say, this model came from this stuff over here. Second, uh, what did my customers actually see? Um, so in this case, let's you know give you an example. Uh, a front or a SRE has a small uh, deployment of both a front end and a model server. Um, and this model server is designed to give you a uh, answer to whether or not uh, the customer on the right should get a loan. So she asks, I'd like a loan. Uh, the front end says no. And the customer says, uh, well, why? And the SRE, you know, is now in bad times, uh, you know, lawyers swoop in. Now the question is why? And the reason is because uh, unlike, you know, in applications, models are really tough to explain. Um, you know, it's not just about the code. It's often about the data you trained on, how you transformed that data, what are the statistics against that data, particularly against protected classes. You know, did you change anything as you moved it out to production and so on. Um, ML ops can really help here. So let's look at that again, but now with ML ops layered over the top. Uh, in this case, we take that pipeline that we layered before and we push it out to the model server. But after that, we then sign everything that went on there. Uh, and then we sign the entire package as this is the entire workflow that we moved through. You move that to a mobile data store. And now when that customer comes and says, why didn't I get a loan? you can say without question, well, it was this exact thing. And we've tested it for bias, and we know that, that you didn't get moved into this class, or you didn't get a no result because of you know, some bias result. Uh, so obviously, that's not great, and, and that's exactly what MLOps is designed for. Now third, uh, let's talk about, is my model still good? Uh, again, this is something you know, that a lot of software developers might not have seen, but this is an area where MLOps can really help. So uh, let me give you a, a sample example. Here you have a barn. Uh, inside this barn, it is either an orange duck or a blue duck. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you that, that that is inside. How are you gonna figure it out? Well, let's use machine learning. Uh, machine learning is awesome. It solves all problems. Uh, so I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna build a really cool model and it detects you know, blue duck or orange duck. Uh, and, the and the model says, uh, you know what? It's a blue duck. I'm like, oh, okay, great. Now let's ask a question here. Uh, there are 995 uh, yellow ducks in the population, and there are five blue ducks in the population. Is the model correct? Uh, it's 99% accurate and 1% false positive. Uh, you know, the, the question is up to you. Uh, you know who knows the answer to whether or not the, the uh, problem is correct? Thomas Bayes, uh, because he came up with this theorem, and this theorem basically says that the accuracy of your model depends on the population distribution. So here you are, you have 99% accurate, 1% positive. I trained this naively, assuming the population was evenly distributed. It's not. Uh, what's the answer here? The answer is my model is wrong two thirds of the time, uh, which is obviously not good. Uh, and, and why is that the case? Well, it's the case because you get false positives for situations where um, you have a very rare population uh, distribution or a very rare uh, uh, discovery in the population. Well, why is this a problem? Well, how about this? Um, criminals are really small percent of our population. Uh, 
Uh, yet, when you uh, train naively against that, and you train naively against the percent of time, per, uh, you know, uh, these um, mug shots appear in the population, you get a result like this, where, you know, the face recognition uh, solution here uh, identified 28 members of Congress with mug shots. And you're like, well, I'm not a member of Congress. Yeah, but you do go fly. Um, and face recognition, uh, opting out of face recognition at the airport, you know, is really hard. Um, so again, this is incredibly critical, especially for all the areas that we want to use ML in. We need to be doubling down on making sure that we have a sensible system. So in this case, we can address it. If you have an automated system for rolling it out, the second you go out and sample the population and say, oh, you know what? It is a very different population. I'm going to go train with knowledge that the population is, is uh, you know, highly um, uh, biased towards one direction. I'm going to train this new model server. And now I can have a lot greater confidence that the model is correct. Now, again, you're like, okay, well, that's great. You've now done it. Uh, what happens next? Um, well, what if the population changes? Uh, and that very frequently happens. Uh, you know, uh, date, time, so on and so forth. Things change very quickly. You'll need an automated system to go and retrain. Uh, models get stale very, very quickly. And it's up to you to watch your population and continuously retrain based on how things change. So um, that's the summary. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that MLOps is, is a critical part of us rolling out machine learning solutions. Um, it gives you best practices, repeatable workflows, and immutable data stores. And that's absolutely critical for a production-ready ML solution. Um, and, and what's next? I think we can do a lot more to bring in a lot of those services and data from the external. Uh, we also need to do a lot to do uh, responsible AI training. Uh, as well as metadata around this so that you have very clean standards on how to write everything up. Um, and, and I do like to end every talk with this. Um, it really is a whole new world. It is up to us, the people watching this call, the people who are using ML today, to make sure that they are doing their best to you know, put ML in the hands of the people who can actually make a difference. You know, I as a, a, a you know, product manager, uh, a, someone building an ML platform, uh, you're not the ones who need this. The ones who need the answers from ML are the you know, frontline uh, nurses and realtors and people looking for bias and people looking for um, you know, professors and things like that. Those are the things that we really need to work on in order to empower them. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd love to uh, take any questions. Hey. Um, Scott just posted in the Slack, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll kick off. I was just curious. Um, yeah, are there, just to give an overview, you know, because I don't think everybody's in the state, but what are the things you feel are general kind of approach commonalities, to just generally how you would think about this space and what are yeah. the specific things for um, people I do think there's probably a good audience. So maybe today machine learning isn't in their, um, on their LinkedIn page. Yeah. They know it's constantly coming up in conversation and they maybe feel like this is not what I got into, but. Yeah, know, machine learning. I mean, it's funny cause you know, um, uh, in, in machine learning, we do really do a, a, a terrible job. I don't know if it's everyone needs to pop up the resume or what, but um, uh, you know, people have been doing machine learning for a long, long time, uh, just not deep learning. Uh, you know, the, the people who built um, uh, scoring systems to look at people's email addresses to figure out whether or not you should uh, forward it onto the sales staff or forward it to staff. I mean, that's effectively machine learning. Um, uh, you know, anywhere you're having a computer help you make better decisions, that's machine learning. And, and the critical element that we're looking at here is anytime you have something being built anywhere in your system, um, that you need to be repeatable, that like, God forbid, the person who built that got hit by a bus. How do you reproduce exactly what they had done? That's what MLOps will help provide. And, and obviously that MLOps is an extension of GitOps. Um, the exact same mentality holds there. Excellent. So yeah, we do have a question. It says, um, do you have any recommendations for metadata stores? I'm looking at um, MLflow and comet.ml currently. Yeah. Uh, looking at DVC for some data, or sorry, same so, for data. So my biggest thing is that, you know, there are a ton of solutions out there. Um, there are a lot of solutions that are very specific to a given step in an overall process, right? 
uh, ML flow comet, uh, weights and biases, so on. They're wonderful at storing experiments um, uh, and runs and things like that for particularly your training. I heard you mention uh, DVC. DVC is great. Pachyderm is another one uh, and so on. They're great for storing the, the data elements uh, and what you did in the metadata around data. Uh, then you have things like serving, uh, uh, Selden, uh, Triton, uh, so on. They're, they're great for that. And, and so what you're really looking at here is um, not just the metadata within a given solution. Uh, you will want that, and, and you'll, you'll really just want to pick the, the solutions that's best for you. But then you'll also want to think about an overall metadata store that allows you to draw all those together. And, you know, I keep hoping someone's going to come along and invent one of those, or one of those core solutions will extend themselves to being appropriate for um, other steps in the pipeline. Right now, uh, you could do worse than just picking a graph database of choice. Uh, something hosted like CosmoDB or uh, something, you know, that you do on your own, like, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Neo J, Neo4j or something like that, uh, that shows you all the details of your, your pipeline and, and stores that metadata there, because that's going to help you graph all that together and show you each of the elements in each of the runs inside it. Awesome. That's fantastic. That's Thanks yeah. for the talk. David, that that was uh, amazing. My uh, my biggest takeaway is that you know all of this machine learning and everything that we do on the back end, it's really to get that data into the hands of the frontline workers, right? Absolutely. If, if if we think about you know during these COVID times that we're in, if some of these models that have been working on for years would have been utilized and brought to the forefront, they could have maybe come up with some some actionable items earlier. But uh, yeah, and, and I I couldn't agree with you more. The the, it, it's it's such a wonderful feeling as a developer to build something that like, oh, okay, well, you know, all my unit tests pass or everything like that. But think of how big a difference you could make where you're actually saving lives if you put sure. this, that same thing in the hands of, of the people who need it. Yeah, um, I, I, we speak a lot with customers. I'm in front of customers all the time. And what I realize is even from developers, the, the biggest thing is that they wanna see their code actually, you know, running in production. So thank you so much for this talk and so much that you're adding to the community. Uh, we really appreciate it. No, thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful.